Welcome to section 21.4a. All right, gentle people, what we're going to explore in this lecture are something called functional groups. Now, what I told you before is that when we look at an alkane, an alkane is fairly unreactive. It is only made out of CH bonds. Now, when we talked about alkenes and alkynes, what I told you guys was that that double bond takes priority. That's because that's the reactive center of the molecule. If the molecule was going to go under a reaction, that's probably the place where the reaction is going to take place. Now, what you'll find is in organic molecules, we will have something called the functional group. The functional group is going to be something other than a CH bond. This is where a reaction is going to take place. So what we're going to do is we're going to classify organic molecules based on the functional group they possess. And that is because when we do a reaction, we are going to use this reactive handle, this functional group, as the center of where that reaction is going to take place. So what we do in organic chemistry is we classify molecules based on their functional group. Now on this slide, what you guys will see is a whole bunch of functional groups. Now we're not gonna go through all the functional groups on here. I'm just gonna be testing you on the ones that I cover in the next few slides. Meaning you should be able to just identify the ones that I cover. Don't worry about the ones that are on this slide that I don't talk about. So the first functional group that I'm gonna talk about is everyone's favorite functional group, and that are the alcohol. So when I talk about an organic molecule, what I can do is I can have a whole bunch of carbons and hydrogens, and then I can have that reactive center. Now that reactive center, that's gonna be my functional group. Now, if I have an OH somewhere on my molecule, we consider that molecule an alcohol. So the general formula of an alcohol is I have a bunch of CHs somewhere, and it doesn't matter if it's branched, unbranched, whatever it is, but attached to that whole bunch of CHs is gonna be this OH group right here. So what I can do, because that functional group is the most important part of the molecule, I can just go ahead and say the rest of the molecule is there, but what I really care about is that functional group. And so this is the general formula where R represents just C's and H's or unimportant things, and the OH is what I'm really interested in. Well, if the R group is just made out of C's and H's, we know that C's and H's make nonpolar stuff. And so in an alcohol, we have a nonpolar portion of our molecule, but let's take a look at what this OH functional group does. So if I were to kind of draw the geometry of this, what we would see is we have a bent structure. And if we take a look at this, we'll notice that this will be a polar molecule. Now you'll notice that we have an O attached to an H. So I have H bonding, dipole dipole, and LDF intermolecular forces. So you'll notice that this set is very similar to water and alcohols have very good solubility in water. And like water, it has a high boiling point. These are very strong intermolecular forces that this possesses. So because that functional group is the most important part of that molecule, we, we name the molecule based off that functional group. So what we can do is we are going to find the longest chain of carbons that contains the functional group. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop the E off that name of that parent molecule and replace it with an OL to indicate that that's an alcohol. So in this case, what you'll see is that there's a carbon chain of two carbons with an alcohol functional group. So it would be ethane if that alcohol wasn't there. So I'm gonna cross out the E and put an OL. So this is called ethanol. This one, one, two, three carbons. If it was just made out of carbons and hydrogens, you'd call it propane. But because of that functional group, we put an OL on the end. So this is propanol. Now, when we look for that longest chain containing the alcohol, you have to tell me where that alcohol is. Now, remember first point of difference. What I wanna do with first point of difference is I wanna look at my priority group 
in this case the functional group, and I want to make sure that it gets the lowest number. In other words, when you have an alcohol, you look for the longest chain and you number that chain such that the alcohol receives the lowest number. So in this case, we have an alcohol and the longest chain containing that alcohol has five carbons attached to it. And so now what we're gonna do is we wanna number it such that the alcohol gets the lowest number possible. And so in this case, we make sure that that carbon is numbered two. So five carbons long, two pentanol. Now based on that numbering, we're gonna go ahead and label our substituents. There's one branch off of here, and the locant of that branch is on carbon number four, so four methyl two pentanol. Now there's a further classification on alcohol. It turns out that the reactivity of these alcohols vary slightly depending upon the carbon that it's attached to. And what I mean by that is we want to see how many other carbons are attached to the carbon that the alcohol is attached to. So here's my alcohol and here's the carbon that I want to go ahead and evaluate. Now I want to count how many carbons are attached to that carbon right there. Now remember, R represents a carbon chain and that carbon chain is attached through a carbon. So in other words, what I can look for is how many R groups are attached to that alcohol carbon. So in this case, what I see is that there is only one R group attached to that carbon. So if there's only one, we call that a primary alcohol. In the middle molecule, what you guys will see is here's the carbon I'm interested in that's attached to my functional group. We'll see that we have one R group, two R groups, so that's called a secondary alcohol. And so in this last molecule, we see here's my alcohol, here's the carbon I'm gonna look at, and what I have are three different R groups, so this is going to be called a tertiary alcohol. Now I want you to note that when I say R, R prime, what this means is that these R groups are carbon chains, but not necessarily the same carbon chain. And if I go R double prime, that means it can be a completely different chain. So in this example, what you guys saw in this middle picture here is one of the R groups was just one carbon long. And in this case, this was two carbons long. So this could be R and this could be designated as R prime. It doesn't matter, these designations are arbitrary. We're just telling you there are different R groups on there. All right, Geno people, why don't you take a look at this molecule and go ahead and see if you can try to name this molecule out. Now, I didn't give you all the information to name it, so I want you guys to use your intuition. If you look at the IUPAC naming scheme, I want you to realize it is a very systematic naming scheme so you should be able to kind of guess how things are named if you don't fully remember how to name something. All right, gentle people, what you'll notice is that we have two alcohols on here. And so what I wanna do is get the longest chain that contains my two alcohols, because remember the functional group takes priority. And what we see is that we have six carbons long. So this is going to be a hexane. And what we would normally do is we would say this is hexanol if I go ahead and have one alcohol. But since I have two alcohols, we're going to keep that E. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a di in front of my all. So the di tells us there are two alcohol groups on here. Now it didn't matter how you number this but you have to tell me where those two alcohols reside. And what we can see is that the first alcohol is on the first carbon and the last alcohol is on the last carbon. So this one would be called 1,6 hexane diol. And so what I want you guys to understand is that if we have more than one functional group, we're still gonna go ahead and use ditri and we have to say where those multiple functional groups reside. So in your book, chapter 21 is fairly displaced from chapter 17. And so they want to remind you guys of this, and that is about solubility. 
And that is, remember the R group is nonpolar. And then the OH group, that's the polar portion. And so the bigger I make my R group, the more it makes the molecule nonpolar. And so what I can do is I can play off the fact that like dissolves like. The bigger my R group is, the more nonpolar it is, meaning it will dissolve better in nonpolar solvents. However, that comes at a cost. The bigger my R group is, that means it will be less soluble in things that are polar, such as water. And that's what you guys can see in here. They remind you of a book question about the length of the carbon chain. The longer I make it, the less soluble I become in water. So let's go ahead and talk about some reactions of alcohols. So remember, I've put a functional group on my organic molecule. I've put a reactive handle on it, so I can do much more reactions with alcohols than with simple alkanes. Now, what you'll see in industry is because alcohols are much more reactive, they are great feedstock chemicals, meaning they make this chemical so that other industries can do reactions with them. So it's a good idea to generate a lot of alcohols. The most simplest alcohol is methanol. And a great way to make methanol is to take carbon monoxide and take hydrogen and put it together. This is a huge industrial process that makes a whole bunch of methanol for us to use. Now, another feedstock alcohol that is mass produced is ethanol. And one fantastic way to make ethanol is the same way that we make our wines, beers, and spirits. And that is the fermentation process. In the fermentation process, what you're going to do is you are going to get something with a lot of sugars. And so this could be grapes, this could be barley, it could be wheat. Basically, it is some organic plant matter. Now, once you get this, what you're going to do is you're going to introduce microbes or bacteria. The bacteria are going to go ahead and consume the sugars that you have placed in with it. Now, what's going to happen is that these sugars possess a lot of potential energy. The bacteria is going to consume this energy, and a byproduct of that consumption is ethanol. Now, you guys don't have to know the little details about ADP, ADP, but what I want you guys to know is that is that fermentation is an industrial process that makes a lot of ethanol for us to consume. This is both feedstock chemicals and it is also used in our alcoholic beverages. So let's go over the last major production of an alcohol and that is to react something with a double bond. Now remember, double bonds, this is gonna be my reactive center. Also remember that double bonds will go under addition reaction. So I can go ahead and add something across my double bond. If I go ahead and have a double bond and I were to go ahead and add water and a little bit of acid catalyst, what I can form is an alcohol. So let's remember our addition reaction. I'm gonna take our double bond and I'm gonna break one out of the two double bonds. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add the new molecule across that double bond. So in this case, water is made out of an OH minus and an H plus. So I'm gonna add these two parts across my double bond. And in doing so, what I will get out is the alcohol. All right, Chem1C, I hope that made sense to you all and remember to stay safe.